And it's wonderful to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces and, uh, and a lot of new faces that have joined us. Uh, it's a real honor to introduce Dr. Philip Kotler. Uh, he's a man justly revered as the father of modern marketing. Uh, during his long and distinguished career at Northwestern University, uh, Phil found time to write, at last count, over 150 articles and 80 books. Um, these books included, of course, the celebrated Marketing Management, which is the most widely used marketing textbook around the world. It's one that I used when I was studying marketing, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have, are familiar with that book. Uh, Dr. Kotler did his master's degree at the University of Chicago and earned his PhD right here in Cambridge at MIT. So uh, welcome home <laughs> to a certain extent. Uh, he received 22 or maybe 23, I, I, don't, I lost count, honorary degrees as well from universities all over the world. Um, if you wanna learn more about Dr. Kotler, I can uh, recommend his autobiography, which is called My Adventures in Marketing, which he wrote all of five years ago. But in those intervening five years, he's written a lot. And what he's going to be speaking about today are seven books um, on different topics that, uh, that yeah, is an enormous amount for anyone, but just a remarkable amount of output for someone who is about to celebrate quite an important birthday at the end of this month. So I won't say which one, I'll let him just say that if he wants. Um, so Dr. Kotler will be with us for 45 minutes and we'll try to answer at the end of his presentation as many of his questions as he can. Um, please put your questions in the chat box on the right. Uh, and uh, we, we will stay, Dan and I will stay online after Phil has left in case there are some uh, other questions that we can answer for you. So without any further ado, please let me uh, welcome Dr. Philip Kotler to the Leaders Excellence uh, program for today. Bill, go ahead. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for the introduction. And Dan, thank you so much for suggesting that I come on your wonderful program. Um, when Dan asked me uh, to, to uh, be invited, I said, uh, look, the best thing I could do is cover seven topics in marketing and business. And it so happens that since 2015, I've written seven books, so maybe those books will cover such things as innovation, very important to companies, branding, new developments in marketing, human-oriented ori marketing, we call it H2H -H marketing, human-to-human -human marketing, social media marketing, the common good, and healthcare marketing. Those were important topics to business and, and marketing. And uh, I will try to take about three minutes to I share with you uh, the content of each book and wh what I'm trying to achieve with the book. So we want to go to this. Okay, let me start with the first book that we will talk about on the important subject of innovation. Uh, you see a picture uh, there of the CEO of Fujifilm, uh, Shigetaka uh, Kamari. He's a brilliant, brilliant leader. And just consider what you would do running a company where the demand dropped to zero, not immediately, but it was destined to disappear, namely the film market. And of course, when the uh, smartphone started, people couldn't believe that it would deliver good pictures uh, in fact, the, there weren't enough pixels uh, at that time. And so Kodak and Fujifilm could take their time um, and milk the rest of the market until it fully collapses. They were, in fact, Kodak had a patent on the cell phone, on the smartphone, but they buried it. Okay, now both of those companies should have died. Well, Kodak did although there's some parts of Kodak around now and here, here and there. But this company not only uh, did not a Fuji film not die, it's probably more prosperous than before. What happened? And I, uh, Kamari uh, asked me to work with him on the history of this and that's the purpose of the book. And what happened is he told his people that the photo market was going to disappear but that his company has so many patents that 
several of them can be turned into wonderful new businesses, but they never had time to do that. The illustration he used is he said, you know, just think when we were making color film, that itself is a 14 step process to make car color film. And each step was the solution to a problem of moving to the next color or something. And each of those could lead to a lot of uh, breakthroughs and so on. As a result, all of his thousands of employees stayed with the company. They trusted him. He was inspiring to them. And uh, the company now is in the business, of course, imaging, but not the, 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 the photo films that we take of our friends and family, uh, but the imaging of the body. They are a leader in how to look into the body of people and to really know what's going on. So that's the imaging work. They are into several medicines. They are set into several medical equipment things that they have developed. And they are even in scared skincare products, which seems far-fetched, but they have been a laboratory of innovation. So any of you in a company ought to look at the story. Now, the story is based on an interesting thing. It's based on, believe it or not, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker, I'm gonna remind you, said that there are only two functions of business that matter. The rest are costs. Production's a cost, counting's a cost, human resources a cost. The two that count are what? Marketing and innovation. By the way, you must be good at both. If you're only good at marketing, but you have nothing to, to, to market as an innovation, that doesn't work. And the same with being innovative, but having poor marketing. So what explains this partnership? Well, I, in the book, bring out the marketing that went into Fujifilm. And uh, Mr. Kamari is such an innovative person. Notice the title we gave to the book, Never Stop, Winning Through Innovation. So should you, what would you expect to find in the book? Uh, you, you'll find the, the basic thesis is this, no company will survive in a world of change without also having the capacity to innovate continuously. And it could be at the lowest level, which means to make the product a little better. Uh, you know, the Kaizen idea of the Japanese. Every day I'll think of a way to make what I'm doing in a better way. Or it could be a, a project or two. Uh, it could be at the greatest level going after the X prize. Uh, you do know that there's an X prize of $100 million to be awarded to a fantastic idea like stopping cancer and so on and so forth. So, but we're expecting most companies to be good at Kaizen, uh, always thinking of ways to make better what they're making and to do uh, uh, new projects and, and to run them well. And by the way, in running a project well, I recommend the uh, thing that I call lean marketing by Eric Ries which is to not take three years to make a new car or something like that, but you sketch out what you're thinking of, you show it to some people, and then they like it or not, if they like it enough, but want some different changes, you make a new sketch, you even make maybe a, uh, what we call an augmented reality. The product doesn't exist, but you've designed it on so in software and therefore you can demonstrate and see how many people are excited and they'll tell you some things that will make it even more exciting. And before you know it, you're, you're uh, doing what we call minimal product design and minimal marketing, but you're learning in the process and coming out more quickly with new products. Okay, let me move on. And the thing is that I, I have to move this further down to the next book. Okay, let's see what happens here. Branding. Okay. Everyone knows that branding has become one of the most uh, important uh, achievements in, in, in a company to, to build a brand. In fact, 
when we ask what what could you do in a in a com highly competitive world to to be a winner and to stay a winner one is to have develop a strong brand that's a must buy by many people in that category that's the must buy brand you also you better have the best channels you you had you should have channel ownership really and then with innovation and a few other things you uh, you're on your way so branding now there's about 200 books on branding and all of them are, pr are pretty good full of stories of, of, of coca-cola starbucks all the great achievements in branding the new uh, thing about this book is to ask whether a brand should simply describe that we have a product and it's priced in the following way and it's available in all stores yes you have to tell the fundamentals of how to get the brand and what it costs but the real question is should it reveal anything about your company uh, after all um, today consumers know so much they, they can find out anything they want about the, any car they want to buy it's all there uh, they, they almost will walk into a, a, a sales room and, and say to the salesman, I want your car, this one on the floor, I, I'll take, and here's the price I will pay for it. So why, why would anyone trust buying that brand? Well, the brand must have a set of values that produce trust, reliability. You, a brand... The, the work you do on your brand should be should accomplish saying who you are and what you care about as a company. This, this goes back to the new thinking that <clears throat> what is the business, what is the purpose of a company? And if you, I have a whole lecture that I've enjoyed preparing on that because business ideas are changing. The old maxim has been purpose of my business is to maximize profits for my shareholders. That's, that's Milton Friedman, my old professor at the University of Chicago. Your purpose is to make as much money as you can, and it will go to, as profits to the shareholders. Well, as you know, there's now a contradictory maxim, maxim and that is the a stakeholder not shareholder orientation. And even uh, the president of the World Bank, uh, Klaus, uh, Klaus um, I will remember his name in a moment, says that it's now that business is thinking more about the stakeholders and rewarding all of them because they are the, the team that won the profits instead of just money going, the profits going to the shareholders. Okay, so we're moving into the question, what is the purpose of your business? And in the most enlightened cases, and I'll tell you a company I, I really admire, and that is Unilever. A, a Unilever and Paul Pullman, who ran it for 10 years, said each year, our business is going to grow by X percent. We're going to have no bad negative impact on the planet, zero impact on the planet. And we're gonna be caring about social problems as well, like hunger, poverty, uh, and homelessness and so on. So suddenly purpose of a company is to make profits, to do it with sustainability, and to do it with some attention to trying to help and reduce social problems. So look at Unilever for more on that. Well, brand activism is almost, you've, you've succeeded if, you, if your brand work itself says what kind of company you are and what you care about. Because then if that's what I care about as a customer, I will, I will follow you. Okay, let me move on. The third book is over here. And it's marketing 5.0. Now you may say, what's 1.0? What's 2.0? Well, 
What's 3.0? All right, here's the history, it's brief. There was no 1.0 book, there was no 2.0 book, but in 2015, uh, my co-authors and I wrote a book called Marketing 3.0. And we, we, we meant 3.0 because um, we wanted to say that when marketing started, it practiced a kind of 1.0, which is just describe the product and its price and where to get it. That's called functional, very functional description. The Russians do that all the time. Before they started to read my books, they would just have a, a straight description of a bunch, a list of products that are available and, and you were supposed to buy on that basis, all right. So then we realized it's better to do marketing 2.0, whatever it is, it's emotional. Namely, you are realizing that 70% of the decisions that people make are based on their emotions. And then they rationalize it with 30%, you understand? And that's not only buyers, that's sellers too. That's even the, the, the guy running an auto company is, is wants a mix of safety and profit. And there's a lot of emotion. And should I introduce this new car? Should I shape it this way? So there's emotion all over buying and selling. That's marketing 2.0. We did do marketing 3.0 and make a case that marketing should be about creating well-being for your customers. Good health, good happiness. And can you your marketing be about making this a better world and through your products? You'll make sure you, you do good products and so on. Okay. Now that was that. Then about four years, about in 2018, we wrote marketing 4.0. Why? Because marketing went was going through a revolution that is almost obsoleting the old marketing or traditional marketing. The old marketing was centered on 30 second commercials and print advertising. And now we had Facebook and we had Google and Instagram uh, and it's digital. The world was becoming digital and you can't, you can't survive unless your company goes digital. And in fact, you better hurry and get as digital as you can, as fast as you can. And I know all your leaders in the company are in their 60s and they never grew up with digital. Well, we can train, we can have their kids train them or we could hire some young people who grew up digitally. You have to do that. You're gonna to have to have, uh, give more power to younger people. And so 4.0, was all about getting ready for the new world. Uh, a few years later, well, this one came out, Marketing 5.0, and it's the la latest one. It just came out in 2021. Why, why are we doing this? Well, we, it, the reason is we cannot write a 800-page textbook every year, right, of the new things that are happening. We have to have 200-page books that will brief management on what is happening in the, in the last few years, bringing management up to date. So in writing 5.0, notice the subtitle, Technology for Humanity. There are so many new technologies. I mean, uh, the word digital covers so many things, but let's, let's be specific. Is your company using drones? Well, I've heard of drones, drones. Do you know that Amazon has talked about shipping some of its products? By, by drone, the product will be dropped on the front stairs of your home, uh, home and there will be a, a, a call to you at the same time saying, saying, open your door because there's a package we just dropped off. All right, maybe some companies can use drones. What about uh, robots? Oh, sure. There's, can we have a cute little uh, robot walking around our store and asking questions or answering questions? All right. That's another technology. What about uh, just AI, artificial intelligence? Uh, can, can, can we do marketing automation? Can we let some common types of decisions be made by our computer programs, even though we're asleep because it's in the middle of the night? 
but things have happened in the middle of the night. Some competitors cut some prices or whatever. Can we develop substitutes for our own decision making that we can trust? And 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 so on. What about chatbots? Chatbots are let's say you have you have a new product that, and people would normally ask questions about it. And we know what questions they're likely to ask. So it's like talking to a, a Siri or Alexa. That's voice recognition. By the way, facial recognition is next. Voice recognition is that um, the consumer can say, tell me how much is, is are you going to charge, charge for that product? And the voice says, well, this is going for, if you have certain conditions, it will be less money. Uh, who made the product? Where was it made? What country was it made in? So a chat box is, is loaded with the answers to any questions that consumers might have in the supermarket where this new product is being demonstrated. Well, I could go on and talk about 3D printing. Um, I have a list of about 20 newer technologies that are covered in Marketing 5.0. Uh, for you to um, uh, pay attention to, and you're not going to uh, get all of them into your business. No, which ones could be critical for your business? Also, um, this is uh, this is basically a, a way of of um, paying attention to to uh, the technological world and incorporating what you can uh, do best. Okay, let me, let me move on because I know you're gonna have some questions and I'd like to uh, be able to address them. Okay, this book I wrote with my uh, German friends, Walter Merfertz and uh, another fine co-author, H2H Marketing, uh, the genesis of human to human marketing. You know, we have to always realize that it's not a customer and a supplier. Yes, but uh, by the way, uh, the essence is really shown in, in, the, in the old sales work that people did. You know, a good salesman knew his or her customer so well. Uh, they, they probably went out for lunch. Uh, they would send, uh, the salesman would send interesting content without any sales messages, just interesting stories to their, they knew their customers so well. And they said, hey, hey, this, this was a wonderful article I read about that basketball player. And I know you love basketball. This human touch is what we're talking about in H2H marketing. And we, in that book, we bring in three of the newest developments in marketing. One has to do with the role of design. Maybe all of marketing is really design. At least if you talk to people who are tops in design, they will do it. They will say that oh, marketing is just a, a design uh, activity and, 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 and challenge. Uh, well, we say a lot about design. We also say a lot about the movement called um, service that in services marketing, that every product is essentially a service, a delivery system for a service. You, we knew that years ago, uh, from when Ted Levitt at Harvard said, you don't want to buy a drill, you want to have a hole. The hole is what you're, you're trying to make, so it takes a drill or something to make the hole. So products are there to create a set of services. And then there are services that are services, like the health service or a barber and so on and so forth. So we bring in a lot of the new thinking about uh, uh, products being essentially a service logic and so on. All right, let me move on to the next uh, one. And this is my fifth uh, book I'm talking about, Social Media Marketing. And you know, it's very important um, to get everyone to understand the basics of the social media revolution. Uh, Facebook and and uh, uh, all and Instagram and um, so many uh, of these social media and how to use them and an interesting story is that Procter and Gamble naturally was one of the first companies 
to go into how to use social media marketing. And they actually took money uh, that they would have used for media, uh, for uh, TV advertising. And they started to put more into uh, uh, social media and they learned a great deal. They also learned that they overdid it. In other words, in their anxiousness to to do a lot of uh, Facebook stuff and, and so on and gather so much information about each of us, what we eat, what media we watch, how, where do we bank? You know, that's the whole thing called the, uh, the, uh, the boom in, in collecting information about individuals with, with its negative implications of privacy. We know about that. But in any case, Procter & Gamble uh, tried every one of these. And you know what? Subsequently, they cut down. They had expanded the budget for social media. But having learned what works and doesn't work, they're back to the right size. In other words, they oversized in the anxiety to get to use these things as quickly as possible. They found out what works and what doesn't work. And we described book, we have lots of case studies here of companies that have gone into uh, social media and what worked and didn't work. So uh, and there's, okay, now we'll go down to the next one. The common good. What is the purpose of our work? Well, our work is normally to do well for ourselves, our family, our company, our friends, our community. Uh, when there are certain decisions that are made that have a big impact on lots and lots of people, and, and that's what legislation is about. All these bills to help certain people, to help certain industries. So I wanted to take a concept that was developed in 1780 by uh, Jeremy Bentham, a great thinker and legislator and philosopher in England. How do we know if something is good for us, for all of us? if it's serving the common good. And his answer was very simple and straightforward, but very subtle, of course. Namely, how many people are gonna be happy with that legislation? How many will be unhappy? And how many will not be affected one way or another? And his answer was simply count the number of people who are happy with it, the number of people who are unhappy, and if the number of happy, happy, if the amount of happiness is, is increased, in other words, there's more happiness created than unhappiness, it's for the common good. Now, um, let's take an example. Should Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax be passed? Is it for the common good? Well, I intuitively believe it would be for the common good. But the, the logic would be how many people would be happier, made happier if, if there was more of a wealth tax that can be distributed through distributed to health causes, better education. How many people would be happy in realizing that the, the money from the tax, the wealth tax would make a lot of happiness and how many people would be unhappy? Well, very few people would be unhappy because it would be the very rich people who have the money that is being highly taxed. So Bermy, uh, 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 he would say, definitely it's for the common good to pass a wealth tax. He would rationalize that having labor unions would be better for the common good because there'd be a voice against the one voice only of business without any checks on from labor's point of view on whether how it's affecting them. So read the common good if there's a lot of issues in your mind that uh, and how to address them. And let me go one more. And that is my uh, book just recently written. It's actually the second edition. The health industry is our one of our major ones and we are always 
sad to learn that our system is much more expensive and not better than France's system. We can name an, uh, the Scandinavian, the Nordic countries have systems that somehow we're, we're spending our, our pills, our pharmaceutical uh, buys are too expensive. Our surgeries, our sur you know, we're, sooner or later, all of us will go abroad for our surgery if we get over COVID. Um, it's, that's called medical tourism now. Uh, to get uh, our hips or or legs uh, fixed or whatever. So what can we do about that? Well, this book is the textbook being used in a lot of business schools and in public health uh, because it covers not only how hospitals work and private medical practices work, but how the pharmaceutical industry works how the medical equipment industry works. And the whole thing is how to build a customer driven health care sy uh, system that is a, one working better for us, better common delivering more for the common good. And uh, Robert Stevens, my co-author is a consultant to so many healthcare organizations of, uh, for their needs. And Joel Shalowitz is on the Northwestern faculty and he was teaching our students all about the health. He's a doctor and, and he has taught our students about the healthcare. So I'm ready to uh, have questions about any of the seven books that I mentioned or any other things in business or marketing that might be happening. So Bill, I've turned back to you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, we've certainly had a lot of comments and a lot of questions uh, while you were while you were speaking. Um, a number of them were treated as you spoke. I think the the biggest topic that uh, generated questions was the whole issue of uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, Shanzal asked if uh, will uh, artificial intelligence take over some marketing decisions? Um, are, does artificial intelligence support marketing or is it just going to make some of our work in marketing obsolete? Would you care to call, comment on that? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm trying to uh, just once a second on that. That's a very good question and I am just trying to check on one thing. Uh, let's see. Um, do you know that today many decisions have been turned over to software? For example, should we admit this student to the Kellogg um, uh, School of Management? Uh, well, we have all of his, his or her characteristics. And we also have a, a, our program which has used all the past characteristics of students who we admitted and how well they did. In fact, we know a lot now about the attributes of a applicant that will make that applicant probably be very successful at Kellogg and, and things that would hurt that likelihood. So we are actually accepting students based on our, 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 our AI that we developed, our program that we've developed. Now, the same is happening in, in, in um, should we release this prisoner? He's been in prison for a while uh, we know his characteristics. We know who we've released in the past, and we know how good, how, how which ones turned out to be bad after the release and good. So, and and the same with loans that banks make. So they're all full of programs now, on um, and every program gets better over time. Technically, I mean, any of your AI uh, software uh, for that problem may be faulty and have biases, hidden biases. But the, but the question is, as you, you're learning all the time, because if you follow up on the decisions that were made and use that as input to improve the decision-making you're gonna make, then the program mm -hmm. gets better and better. So my, my answer is, now there's some things that can't be turned over to computers that uh, will call for, and in fact, I think that uh, a, smart, a, smart, a smart college like Kellogg 
would let would say what so the program rejected accepting that student but you know that student has certain traits that we have no measure of we know he has that positive trait but we never did anything with that trait we've got to override the program so look the combination we're trying to say that machines are not going to replace us they are partners to us in the decision making we've got to keep the the human sense of sensitivity and sensibility as part and over, override some of our AI pro, uh, programs because they intrinsically are unable to handle certain things that we can't measure that carefully. Yeah, there were several questions on how AI adds value to the marketing uh, to, to marketing decisions, and I think you've 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 said that that it's it's a partner and it adds value by being a, a good tool that we can use. The other issues that kept coming up quite frequently in the questions were uh, questions about brand activism. And if you're an individual consultant, uh, should you be trying to use brand activism uh, to, to uh, generate more businesses? How do, you, how do you market with brand activism? Well, I, I was gonna put together some at some point, not only the, the PowerPoint slides for a, a talk on brand activism, but I would have included the several stories of brand activism that, that illustrates how to use it. The basic idea is, do you want to develop a narrative about your company? I mean, is there a narrative? That, now, a lot of, I might say of some companies, listen, you, you have a narrative, but I don't need to hear it. I mean, I'm, I'm out to buy something and you have something I might want to buy, but but yet we get interested in the narratives. Take Coca-Cola. Oh, do we know things about the history and that Coca Coke, Coke was uh, partly with some bad stuff in it and all that. There's a whole narrative. Tell your story, company. Tell your story. People are interested in you making yourself human. Uh, I want to know if I can trust you. What's your story as a company? Henry Ford, you know, we know the Henry Ford story, uh, but we also know the story of uh, them trying to create a car. What was that called? That was named after their one of the sons. Do you remember? Yes. That's a story too. Where, when you saw the car that they created at Ford, it's like one team worked on the front of the car and designing it. The other team worked on the back of the company uh, car, and they it just didn't work out to be a. A, 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 a something I'd be proud to drive. So what are, what's your story as a company? And if you have a good story, um, get it out in the, your brand work because that's more lasting than, than the particular thing you're saying uh, today about the, the, the product itself. Can you say more about you as well as about your product. You know who does a good job of that? Starbucks. Starbucks tells us, we're your third home. Your first home is where you live. The second is your office. No, it's not. We, we're, we're home nowadays too. And the third is Starbucks. And sit down, enjoy what we have, invite your friends. We're there for you. This caring, how, do you, how does a company express that it cares? So brand activism is work you do in sharing the story of your aspirations as a company. What do you care about? What, what are your good deeds? By the way, there's an increasing number of companies now who at the end of the year in their annual report are reporting their good deeds. I just saw a, you know, we use EG, is it ESG, governance, E, environment, S and governance uh, is one code, way to code, a list of things. It's like, what, Henry Ford, what were your contributions this year in, in the work you do with cars and, and so on? What, what, what did you do about social problems, anything? Uh, and, and then certainly we want to hope you're doing good environmental work. You're, you're, you're choosing, you're, 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 you know, too many companies create 
uh, negative uh, impacts that they don't have to be responsible for. Uh, they, they, you know, the coal mine, the coal mine digs out uh, the coal, but leaves an, a mess behind. Uh, if they were charged for, for covering the costs that they put onto society, coal would be more expensive and we would sell less coal. So those are called ne negative externalities and we would like all companies to be responsible for the negative externalities that come about in their production and distribution. So, so we're any getting toward the end of the, of, of the 45 minutes that you promised us, but um, the, the, there, are, there have been a couple of questions on ethics and spirituality. And as your career is getting, it has been over so many years, how have you, how have you seen that change over time? And what lessons have you, uh, have you learned from that? Um, well, I, I, I went into economics, you know, I'm an economist. Marketing is a branch of economics, and by the way, a branch that the economists don't recognize. That's right. Because it has some social science in it too, you know? Uh, so I, uh, going to both uh, Milton Friedman, uh, not Nobel Prize winner at, at the UFC, and then having two more prize winners on my committee at MIT, namely Paul Samuelson, and we all grew up with Paul Samuelson, and Robert Solo, I ended up not liking classical economics because that uh, postulated the rational man who had full information and was always going to make the right decision. Now, when I joined Northwestern's faculty, uh, Don Jacobs, the Dean said to me, Bill, you can teach all the economics you've learned at these uh, schools or you could teach marketing. I think you, you'd be better off teaching marketing. So I said, Don, you're right. Economics is a pretty settled field with a scientific aura. Marketing is considered very practical, uh, but not with much science. You know, they, they would list the traits of a salesman, but there was no research to show you what traits really make a good salesman. So if you could write a about marketing in a way that is uh, based on economic theory, research uh, findings, and so on. And then in 1967, I wrote my marketing management book, which, by the way, for those of you who uh, want to be current, uh, the uh, 16th edition is coming out this year, uh, and it will be fantastic. I uh, am working with two others on it, and uh, Alex Chernoff uh, has joined the work on it from Northwestern. So, but the main thing is notice what happened. What happened is the um, economists themselves created something new called behavioral economics. And they gave the Nobel prize uh, in economics to the guy at the University of Chicago based on his work in nudging. Now what's a nudge? It's basically that we can influence business decisions and consumer decisions by loading the architecture of choice. There's an architecture of choice. And if we could bend and reshape the architecture of choice, we can get more people to uh, sign up for donating blood. Or if we put the options in the right way, we can influence the decision-making. All right, so behavioral economics surface, which is what it should have been. And to me, marketing is the essence of behavioral economics because for 100 years, we've, we have studied how people make real decisions. So um, that got me into this writing business too, because by looking, there's, I just got a, a notice uh, in my mail that I, I won the award for the most, uh, most people have read behavioral economics from my writings, but it's called behavioral economics, not classical economics. Now I almost forgot your question, Bill. But I no, thought I'd <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of nodding heads in the, uh, in the mosaic here and uh, it, it's a it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful answer. I think someone brought up that the, the S was sustainability, 
And I think that's become a, a big issue in the environment, sustainability, and governance. I believe you're right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I know you promised. Uh, we promised you uh, 45 minutes. If you'd like to answer one or two more questions, we'd be delighted. Yeah. If there's another question or two, sure. Certainly. Yeah. We've we've gotten a lot of questions on the human to human marketing. Uh, I think the 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 whole notion of that is is a little difficult for some people. Could you say just a couple more words on that? Well, yes. Um, in fact, it would take me to a specific part of that, and that is how do we uh, work with our employees? Uh, are we being human toward our employees? Because I read statistics sometimes that maybe 70% of the people, when asked, are they happy at their work, say no. I'm not very motivated, it's drudgery. Um, you know, so there's always gonna be people who are happy about the jobs they have, but take even the law profession. Take how, find out how many lawyers are happy being lawyers. It's not very high. Uh, so the question is, um, but in, in the work situation, um, are we paying our people enough? Well, $7.45, our minimum wage, still officially is unlivable income. That's poverty level. And, but it's not just income. It's, it's not that, it's, it's how the office, you remember the, you know, the film, what is called the office and the, the office becomes a playground. Uh, we, we're all amused by, by uh, what happens in that filming of things happening at the office. But the thing is, are your employees happy with management, happy with their bosses? By the way, do people need bosses? There's a new thing. I work with a company called Hire, a Chinese company. They make refrigerators and so on and so forth. Um, they don't have bosses now. They have a system called holography. I hope I'm pronouncing it well. H-O-L-A, holography. It's not democracy, it's holacracy or something like that. And basically, you shouldn't have a boss. You should be always a member of a team and the team is the team and you're working from one project to another. And, and, and the official bureaucracy, a steady, stable set of people at the top, middle and down, they, they've, they're eliminating. So the main thing is that... Uh, um, how do you, how are you being managed in a way that satisfies you? Are you motivated? Uh, that touches the H to H idea that it should be human to human. And, and companies, uh, you can find some, some distinguished companies who care a lot about their employees. They, they're the ones who are gonna vote for, for childcare. They're going to help people be more comfortable working for them while taking care of their family. What's, what, what's happening now is a lot of people uh, in, in business have to worry about their parents above them and then their children. And then yet they work five days a week, uh, eight hours a day. And what about the human dimension of the work experience? And how can we improve this? So we're now seeing a lot of legislation coming from the Democratic Party to meet a lot of needs that were neglected or not, not handled. And I'm noticing a thing, and all of you might think about this, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, business is moving faster than politics, especially a lot of Republicans are off, off tune with what's happening. That and I wrote an article recently, I haven't published it yet, that the Republicans are in danger of losing, losing the, uh, the, 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 the business. That in fact, that some businesses which have been very generous to the Republican party are uh, wondering about supporting that party. Which is a po which wants nothing to happen. The Republicans don't want anything to happen with legislation, because the purpose is 
he must fail, Biden must fail at his job. That's no way to run a country. So I don't want to get political, but uh, you can tell that we watch what's happening to business and more and more businesses are supporting the things that are being proposed now because it would make society better. It will put more money in the hands of buyers. And what is better for a company to see a world with people having a lot of money to buy their product. And that's what we have to aim for. Well, I'll stop Bill here because we also have to be richer in the process. Thank you very much, Philip. It was a, it was a wonderful hearing from you. Uh, we had over 300 people uh, listening to us some students who are asking about uh, how do they approach marketing as a career. I'm sorry we couldn't, couldn't get to that question unless you'd like to say one last word on that. <laughs> but I think well, I, look, I, I would, <laughs> sure, you know, basically um, I, I, there's always good careers in finance uh, and in uh, human resources and in production uh, and so on. The one thing about marketing, it moves faster and changes more and causes more interesting problems than some of the other fields that are more standardized and routine, routinized. Uh, just like I would never wanna teach geometry because it hasn't changed in 200 years. I chose marketing because uh, God, it's so fascinating and, and, and you have to put up with a lot, but uh, the challenge is always gonna keep you uh, busy and alive. Well, you've certainly proven that with your career, Philip. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for your, for your time. Uh, I'll pass this back to Dan to say a, one quick last word. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we will stay online after Phil departs uh, if, if we can try and uh, answer some of the questions that I've seen coming up. But Dan, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hi, <laughs> Hi Phil Carla. So thank you so much for doing the session today for us. It has been great. You know, uh, thank you so much again. And uh, we will just stay live here. So uh, you can uh, just turn off and- Sure, I'll uh, do that. Continue. I, I, will, I will have to leave anyways, Dan, but let me just thank you so much for your uh, leader program at Harvard Square and so on. This idea of excellence in leadership is a marvelous thing that you've been doing for everyone. So we'll, we'll keep following your work too. So I'm going to leave now, and I wish you the best to everyone who took the time. And I've seen, I see you on my screen, but I'm going to leave now. <laughs>